What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Church Online. If you're tuning in for the first time, my name is Billy. And during this service, uh, if you have any questions or you need prayed for, please use our chat feature. I'm just one click away along with our other hosts. And I'd really love to hear from you and help in any way that I can. Um, there aren't any announcements today, but before we sing some songs together, I just want to remind you to grab whatever you need uh, for communion today, um, whether it be bread or a bagel, maybe a donut, and then grab something to drink, if, even if it's not juice. All right, let's get ready to sing together. Each week when we gather, uh, in person and online, we eat bread and we drink juice together. And these items are symbolic of Jesus' body and His blood. And when we eat and drink, we're reminded of the body of Christ being tortured and crucified, His, his blood being poured out for our sins. So I want to ask you guys, would you take communion with me today? I'm going to start with the bread. So God, we thank you for sending your Son and Jesus, we thank you for allowing your body to be broken for us um, to cover our sins. We take this bread now. And Jesus, when we, when we drink of this cup, uh, we're reminded of the blood um, that you poured out on the cross for us, the blood that you, you did not spill um, unintentionally, but that you gave willingly for us to cover our sins. Thank you, Lord, so much for the sacrifice that you've made for each and every one of us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There's this really cool story in the Gospels where Jesus is walking through a town called Jericho, and he's met with a huge crowd. And one of the members in the crowd is a man named Zacchaeus. If you grew up in church, you knew him as a wee little man. But Zacchaeus had heard all about Jesus. He, he wants to be as close as possible to him to see him face to face. But Zacchaeus also had a reputation for financially taking advantage of so many people. He was a tax collector. And what he does is he climbs a tree to get a better view of Jesus. And to his surprise, Jesus calls him down out of the tree and invites himself over for a meal. And we don't exactly know what they talked about. All we know is that after their meal together, Zacchaeus repays four times over all the people that he's wronged. And with what he had left, he gave away half of it to the poor. And so what's this have to do with our time of offering today? I mean, I would assume that most of us, <laughs> um, if, not, if not all of us tuning in, we've never financially oppressed somebody. But what we can learn from Zacchaeus is that encounters with Jesus often compel us into generosity. And that's what I wanna thank you for today, GCC. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for partnering with us to do God's work for His kingdom.
Well, hey, GCC Online, it is good to be with you. A couple weeks ago, we began a message series titled, So Others May Know. And throughout eight weeks, we're walking through the letter of 1 John. Now, because of that, I want to rejog our memory just a bit. If you notice, the letter of 1 John is different from the gospel according to John, although the same person wrote both of them. The gospel according to John is a biography of the life and ministry of Jesus. And the letter of 1 John is an actual letter. The official term for that is an epistle written to the church in the first century. However, this letter is different from other letters in the New Testament. For example, Paul's letters, they're often written to specific people or specific churches. For example, you have Romans, you have Titus, 1 and 2 Timothy, 1 and 2 Corinthians. Well, 1 John, along with several other letters, are written to the wider church, meaning they were supposed to be read by many congregations. That's why that group of letters are called the Catholic epistles. Not because they're Roman Catholic, but because they were written to the universal church, which is the original meaning of that word Catholic. Now, That's a lot of information. If you're a Bible nerd, you absolutely love that. But long story short, 1 John was meant to be read by a multitude of congregations in that day. It was written so that the entire church could profit from reading it. And even though it was written to the church in the first century, we can profit from it today in 2024, just like they did. And so today, if you have a Bible with you, we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. And there are two main things that John is addressing in his letter. First, he's addressing the importance of staying faithful to the gospel when others try and tempt us to deny Jesus and deny who he really is. And then secondly, he's addressing the assurance of salvation that we have when we're in relationship with Jesus. And so here's what John writes in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He writes, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. Now today, sending a text or a DM to the group chat saying, my dear children, let's be honest, it would just be weird, but it would also just be a bit condescending. But in the first century, by saying this, the Apostle John, who held a a position of authority, is showing his affection for the church. He cares deeply that all Christians would experience freedom in Christ. And his desire is that no one would sin, that all would be free from the shackles of our brokenness, which only happens through following Jesus. But he also knows how much our brokenness wreaks havoc in our lives and the world around us. And this is where the theme of assurance comes in. Because when we fall, which we all will, we all have, we can have assurance that by confessing our sins to God and to one another, that we'll be forgiven because Jesus has made us righteous. He has placed us in right relationship with God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And as John points out, it's Jesus' sacrifice that atones, or in other words, covers our sins. It is through that perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that we're made right with God. All our sin, past, present, future, was dealt with on the cross. And now we can step into that forgiveness and new life by trusting in Christ alone as Lord of all creation. So if we've been made right with God through Jesus' death and resurrection, what now? I mean, clearly the goal is not to sin, but if we do, and we will, we can be forgiven. But does God just want us to kind of sit on our hands and wait until Jesus comes back? Are we supposed to just watch world events unfold around us as we live in fear and hide away? What are we supposed to do? What's the finish line or the end goal of the life of the Christian? Well, let's keep reading in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. One thing I love about scripture is that it will always challenge us. The writers of the New Testament, they'll never pull any punches But sadly, I think we often do. One mistake that I think many Christians make is believing that we don't need to follow Jesus' commands or that Jesus' commands are unattainable. They're so high and they're so lofty that it's actually impossible to obey the commandments of Jesus and live as he did. So we might as well just stop trying. But rather than just accepting that idea and saying this is really hard, it must be unattainable, let's look at some examples in Scripture. 
In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus presents what life in the kingdom of God is really like. If you want to know what it looks like to follow Jesus, read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. At the end of the sermon, this is what he says in Matthew 7. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains, when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus himself was calling the crowd, and by extension us, to obey the commands that we find in the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, it's implied that in some way, somehow, it is attainable. Let's take a look at the Great Commission, which is Jesus' marching orders for the disciples after he rose from the grave. This is what it says in Matthew 28. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. A part of the Great Commission is to teach new disciples to obey all that Christ has commanded. Again, implying that some way, somehow, it is attainable. And then finally, let's look at James 2. This is what he writes to the church. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? In other words, true saving faith will always work itself out with good deeds. Faith without works, is dead. And so today, when we read scripture, we're confronted by Jesus, and we're called to a higher way of living. And sadly, too many of us have rele relegated being a Christian to mentally ascending to particular doctrines or particular ideas about God, and believe them like we believe in math equations, two plus two equals four, or Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States, and then Jesus is the son of God, etc., etc. just a list of facts. But scripture clearly points out that true saving faith will always work itself out in how we live. And so if we truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Lord of all creation, then we will listen to his commands. We will listen to what he says is good, true, and beautiful. And so, of course, this isn't by our own power. We do all of this with the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. But this is the journey of the Christian. This is the telos, the end goal, to become like Jesus, to live as he did. Again, this is what John writes in 1 John 2, 6. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And by the help of the Spirit, with a lot of grace, we can embark on that journey together. But this shouldn't turn into a contest of who can be more perfect. The goal is to become more like Jesus, not to show how good we are at being spiritual. That's what the Pharisees did, and Jesus, he didn't have a lot of nice things to say about those guys. Instead, we need to keep the first two verses of this passage in mind. The desire is that we wouldn't sin, but if we do, and we will, we can have assurance and confidence that when we confess our sins, that God is actually faithful and just and will forgive us because Jesus has washed our sins away. That's what we explored last week. So our sins past, present, and future are washed away. The goal is to live our lives as Jesus did. But what does that actually look like? Is it following a list of spiritual practices or is it something else? Well, let's keep reading in verse 7. Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the, tru the truth of this commandment and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims, I'm living in the light, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness." So the true light that is shining is Jesus in the kingdom that he brought when he came to earth. It's what's known as an already but not yet reality. Is the kingdom of God, new creation reality here? Yes, 
Victory was won through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We are new creations in Christ. The kingdom of God has come. New creation is here. But you'll notice that there's still brokenness and pain and suffering in the world. We still experience loss and heartbreak. Sin is still a reality. And this is the not yet part of that. The kingdom of God has come in Jesus through his life, death, and resurrection. Now we wait for his return when the new creation reality is fully realized and Christ makes all things new. We see John teasing this out when he wrote, for the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. For us to live as Jesus did is to carry this kingdom of God reality into a dark world. In other words, we get to participate in Jesus' work of restoring all of creation. And this fleshes itself out most clearly in how we treat others, particularly how we treat other followers of Jesus. If we're constantly fighting with others, goss gossiping about others in church, spreading rumors or excluding others, can we honestly say that we're living like Jesus? I think truthfully, we can't even say that we're trying at that point. But when we treat others poorly and we harbor hate towards others for whatever reason, we've allowed darkness to envelop us and we're no longer walking in the light. We've given ourselves over to the way we used to live before we knew Christ. But this is hard, isn't it? I mean, what if we've been seriously hurt or abused by someone who called themselves a Christian? What if we've experienced serious pain at the hands of the church? And honestly, I feel that pain personally as well. Some of my deepest wounds that I've experienced have been at the hands of people who declare to follow Jesus. A little bit ago, I mentioned that to live like Jesus, we need the help of the Spirit. And this is extremely evident when we walk through pain and suffering at the hands of others. Because if you're like me, your natural tendency is to write those people off, to deem them irredeemable. What happens to them? Who cares? Whatever suffering comes their way, they deserve it. But with the help of the Spirit, we learn to forgive because we've been forgiven. I mean, after all, I'm certain there are people who I have treated poorly. Worse yet, I've rebelled against the very God that I've claimed to love so much, and yet He's forgiven me, showing mercy and giving me the grace to turn away from sin. And so if we've been forgiven by Jesus for all the wrong that we've done to Him and to others, to live like him is to forgive others who have done wrong to us. And it's not easy, and it does not make what they have done okay, but Jesus never told us the Christian life would be easy. Instead, he told us it would give us true fulfillment. And so through the ups and the downs, we do our best with the help of the Spirit to love those around us. It's the natural movement of a committed follower of Jesus. We experience deep intimacy with God, a deep inner life with God, and then that overflows into showing the love and care of Jesus to the world around us. And this is why true faith is never private, because true faith will always impact how we live publicly. And so to be a follower of Jesus is to live according to a different reality, the kingdom of God reality. Now we are not bound by the darkness of the world. Instead, we walk in the light, carrying this light with us wherever we go so that others may know the goodness of Jesus and what walking in the light truly is. And so as we close, let's read these final verses from our passage. It's 1 John 2, starting in verse 12. I'm writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ, who existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you who are young in faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. I've written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I've written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ, who existed from the beginning. I've written to you who are young in, in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. John's doing something amazing here. He's using the natural stages of human growth to explain what is true of his audience, the church. Again, weaving in the assurance of being children of God. Like children, we need help. We need forgiveness. And we do so by running to the arms of the Father with full faith and trust in Jesus. And in doing so, we're forgiven and we're reminded of our identity as children of God. It reminds me of my son, Mateo. Yesterday, we celebrated his first birthday and as a father, it's been amazing to see him grow and develop because I knew him when he was a newborn, having no clue what was going on around him. 
now, hearing him fumble around as he tries to walk, say words, play with toys. He doesn't always get it right. He isn't always able to say every word. He doesn't know how to play with every toy. He gets into a ton of things that he shouldn't, but he's confident in my love for him. He knows that when he crawls, stumbles, or walks towards me, that I'll receive him with open arms and, of course, lots of kisses. And this is the kind of confidence that we can have in the Father's love. Now in Christ, we are children of God. As John said in chapter 1, in the, in, in the beginning of chapter 2, we will sin, but we must get up assured of the Father's love and then walk in forgiveness as we press on to become like Jesus. John then uses the imagery of maturity. We've experienced the eternal God, and we do so when we gather to worship, when we pray and read scripture, when we pray and live in community with other believers. We know Christ, who existed from the beginning, the eternal Son of God, which leads to John using the language of young in the faith. This can also be translated as young adult. And if you know anything about young adults, they're usually strong and adventurous, this is why athletes are at their peak as young adults. They're strong, full of energy, and can tackle almost any task. And so as Christians, we've encountered Jesus. We know him. Now through our union with him, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to overcome the, the temptations of our enemy, the devil. Now we can overcome the enemy and his attacks against us. And because we have the spirit of the living God inside of us, this is how we are able to live as Jesus did. And so as we go into the week ahead, here's my encouragement to you. Do an audit of your day, of your week, and of your month. Are there things in your daily, weekly, or monthly rhythm that hinder you from living as Jesus did? Maybe it's a friend group that leads you into temptation. Maybe it's a habit you've formed over time that causes you to sin. And once you've identified those things that hinder you from becoming like Jesus, Identify the practices or the habits that you could replace those things with. Habits like praying and reading scripture, memorizing scripture, being a part of a community group here at GCC, serving on a Sunday. And this is important for us as Christians because becoming like Jesus doesn't just happen. It's not unintentional that we'll become like Jesus. It takes intentionality. Just like becoming an athlete takes intentionality in training. If I wanted to become the best long distance runner in the Mahoning Valley, I would need to change some things about my life. I would need to start running more regularly and for longer distances. I would need to change my diet and eat better foods. I would need to make sure I'm stretching and getting enough sleep each night so that I can recover quickly. And we know this is true. If I want to become the kind of person who is great at long distance running, I need to shape my life around that. It's also true in our spiritual life though. We want to become people who are like Jesus. Therefore, we need to shape our life around him so that we will actually be formed to become more like him. And as we do, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit and are assured of the Father's love, stumbling, falling, but always getting back up and walking in his forgiveness. And so will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your love. Lord, thank you that like a small child, we can stumble along the way in this life of following your son and you receive us with open arms. Lord, would you give us the grace and would you empower us with your spirit to become more and more like Jesus? And so, Lord, as we go about our week, as we go about our days, Father, help us to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Lord Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. And Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. Today's worship time was so good and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope that you've been encouraged and challenged. And as we go into this week ahead of us, I, I, I pray that you would be thinking about two questions. What has God said to you today? And what are you going to do about it? And hey, before we leave, I just want to encourage you, if you do have any prayer requests or you have any questions that, that you want answered, I am just one click away in the chat. Or you can email me at the email address below, bhartwig at greenfordchristian.org. I would really love to talk with you and connect and pray for anything that you guys have that you need prayed for. 
But if not, I hope you guys have an awesome week and we'll see you next time.